For more on the crisis at our southern border and really what should be done about it, Congressman Don Bacon is with us tonight. Congressman, thanks for joining us. Earlier today, you and your Republican right. colleagues received a letter from Speaker Johnson about those bipartisan border negotiations in the Senate. It said the following, I'm quoting directly here, quote, the Senate appears to be unable to reach any agreement. If the rumors about the contents of the draft proposal are true, it would have been dead on arrival in the House anyway. Is Speaker Johnson throwing in the towel too quickly on these talks? Senate negotiators told me yesterday these talks very much still ongoing. Well, the big hang up in the Senate right now is the how we're going to define parole and what kind of parole authorities we're going to give uh, the president. Uh, president Biden would like to have a lot of parole authorities where he could release anybody he wants back into the country. The Republicans would like to restrict that to the bare minimum. So that's sort of where the debate's at in the Senate. I do think that the what was leaked out of the Senate, where they were at, was very badly mischaracterized, is my impression. Because I went over to Senator Sinema's office and I've talked to other I'm a big fan of Senator Langford. I think he's a smart, good conservative who's going to negotiate well on our behalf. But, you know, what was characterized by some was that we were going to let 5,000 people in our country every day. That was not really the case. The, the goal was to have enough court, asylum courts, that you could do 5,000 a day within the three or four days of them getting to the country, of which we know in the past 85% lose their asylum cases, they can be sent right back to their home countries, which 15% get approved. That was sort of the goal of this agreement, was to be able to get a 5,000 a day capacity and then mm -hmm. do the courts right away and kick out 85% that don't qualify. And I think that's a lot mm -hmm. better spot than where we're at today. And anything over 5,000 wouldn't be allowed in the country. Uh, so that was sort of where the talks well, were so at, but it was characterized in the leaks that we were gonna let 5,000 people in our country every day. And that's not, wasn't the case. So we have former President Trump weighing in. Uh, you could see this as him trying to sandbag it so that he has a great issue to run on in 2024. Or you could say he thinks maybe I'm going to win. I want to say in all of this, you know, I want some input on what parole authority I'll have as president. Either way, we have Greg Abbott and we have 25 other governors saying, listen, the federal government wants to cut down the razor wire. They want to do away with the buoys. They want to make it easier to enter the country illegally. Do they have a legal right, as you understand it, to enforce that? Because you're in Congress. Our understanding is at least that you're supposed to be the ones making the rules. Well, immigration authorities is given to Congress. However, if I was a governor, the people are demanding action right now, and it's not being done. The president, in my view, has failed in this area. And you can see it. When President Trump was in charge, he put in multiple executive orders. He enforced the law in a very conservative way, and it largely worked. And then on day one, uh, President Biden did multiple executive orders getting rid of the Trump uh, policies. And he actually, during the campaign, said he hoped that we would have a surge at the border. He actually said that in the debate with Bernie Sanders. And so I think he's failed, but Congress has a role that we could pass a much more stricter policy than we should. But if I was a governor, it's the number one issue for people right now. In my district in Nebraska, okay. this is the number one issue. And so you, you as an elected official, he's, they got to respond. So I totally get what mm -hmm. the governor of Texas is doing, and I support it. So, sir, I have to ask you, you are a Republican. You have not formally endorsed Donald Trump, as I understand it. We have this breaking news, E. Jean Carroll. The decision comes out tonight. Donald Trump owes her $83 million for defamation. Do you worry about your party's likely nominee being convicted of sexual abuse, repeated defamation? Does that worry you? Well, I want to win in November, so I'm concerned how this will play out come around November. You know, I've been a, a fan of, I was a fan of Nikki and Tim Scott. I know uh, Mr. DeSantis, Governor DeSantis very well. We served together. He's a good Christian family man. And so my heart was there. But in the end, I'm going to support our nominee, uh, because who's going to secure the border? Who's going to appoint the best Supreme Court justices? Who's going to provide st stable uh, po uh, regulatory policies for our, our, our small businesses? Uh, in the end, the issues that our voters are caring about are, are these areas, and, and the President Biden is failing at them. Congressman, in, in the last 30 seconds or so here, look, you're up for election, to your point. You need a bipartisan coalition in your area of Nebraska. It's one of 
the biggest, most toss-up swing seats. It was rated as even, not R plus, R plus zero, D plus zero. Do you think that your supporters, among your supporters, that these legal challenges could pose a challenge to your party as a whole? Could they drag you down among the moderate independent voters who elect you year after year? Well, you know, in 2020, uh, we lost the top of the ticket by about 7%. I won it by about 5% uh, wait, when you round it. And so that's a pretty good spread. And I think it, it was an issue in 2020, but now we have a couple of new factors a lot of folks were hoping President Biden could, could do better here. And the fact is, the average citizen here has lost 5% of their purchasing power because of inflation. The raises, pay raises didn't keep up with inflation. The border is the number one issue. As a military guy, I served 30 years in the Air Force, nothing disgusted me more than what happened in Afghanistan. So I just think there's some other factors here now that will, they're going to be anew in the calculation for this district. Uh, but I would say this, uh, Nebraskans, Mm. Especially in our district, most of Nebraska is actually much more conservative. My district is a toss-up. I would say they lean center-right, but they do like decency. They want somebody that wants to govern and try to make improvements. Uh, they don't like the they don't like a lot of brash uh, shouting and, and mm. insults and stuff like that. It, we're much more in a it, we're, there's a term here, Nebraska nice, and it's real. We got you. Yeah. We got you. Republican Congressman from Nebraska, Don Bacon. Congressman, thanks for joining us on this Friday night. Thank I'll you. see you back at the Capitol. Mm -hmm.